Hello, everyone. This is Matt Denninger. Uh, everyone is in listen-only mode. And if you look to the right of your screen, there is an area to add uh, chat. You can either send it to everyone or you can send it just to me. And I will check this from time to time to, uh, to see if there are any questions. I also have a cohort who is sending me chats over the phone. So if I sound like I'm pausing at times, it's just to read her chat because there might be something important like nobody can hear you. Um, so um, it's a couple minutes after and we'll get started. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining. And there are still a few people coming in. Um, there will be time for Q&A uh, at, at the end. But if you do have a question that you'd like to have clarified, please do speak up. Um, I can help uh, either way. And um, so my name is Matt Denninger. I'm the head of customer success for Trimble Ag Business Solutions. Uh, we do software and services for the Trimble Ag team. Customer success means um, I'm responsible for a small group of inside salespeople who help growers select uh, the software that meets their needs. We onboard people, uh, we train folks, and we have a support team. So there you go. And I'd like to go down to the next page. Hmm, it's frozen. That's not good. So we'll do it this way for now. There you go, much better. So here's the agenda. Uh, so we'll start off with a brief introduction and provide some context for what we mean when we're saying software and why we're involved in software. And then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is about 15 or so real world success stories of what people have done with software to help you envision what you think it could help you. Not everything will pertain to you, uh, just like not every farm is the same. We have a slide or two on our view of how to evaluate the return on investment of software. A slide or two on our personal training uh, program. And then a slide on things to consider when purchasing or buying or shopping for software. Now, if I was doing this in a room of people at a conference, I, I would start off with a little bit something personal, just to let you know that this is a real person here at Trimble. I've been a husband for 22 years. Um, I get a re-up uh, every year. My wife renews. I'm really happy about that. Two daughters that are juniors. Uh, they're 16. Grew up in upstate New York. Youngest of 10. Uh, so I've had to fend for myself for a while. Um, a Hoosier and a Wolverine, which makes interesting Saturdays during football season. 25 years of customer-facing roles. I joined Trimble uh, close to four years ago now. And as you can see, I, I really like the outdoors, uh, living in Colorado. So that's me. Uh, now let's talk about what you came here for. So you just to tee up all of the use cases, I thought it would make sense to, just to talk about what, how we see software uh, for a couple slides. And as you know, growers have used data for a long time. And as you go from left to right across this screen, there's a Sumerian tablet from the 14th to 15th century BC of a landowner instructing the operations manager of, of what to do on the field. Um, we have a farmer's pocket ledger. It's been in use for a long, long time. Uh, an Excel sheet, and then a cloud-based software on the far right. And all four can create and record plans pretty effectively. They do their job. Um, if, but if you wanna record the results quickly and perform calculations, then you move into the three on the right. Um, the two on the right, the Excel sheet and software, it's a lot easier to manage the changes. And it's a lot easier to use data from the prior season and the current season without a lot of uh, extra work. What cloud-based software provides is access to that data in the field using your smartphone. And it's also multi-user. And what, what do we mean by that? Well, if you use Excel, and you have someone else in the office that is also using that document and you need them to be done with it before they can send it to you so that way you can update it, that's really single user. Multi-user means different people can add data 
to the platform, to the software at the same time. Um, if you, the grower, are out in the field and you see something and you record it on a scouting report um, while someone else is uh, spraying a different field, all of that data can be brought in at the same time. And the architecture within the software organizes it so that way you can use it effectively. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the ROI slide at the end. When we look at ag software, um, we see five pieces because there are a lot of types of software out there. And there are five things that ag software does when you boil it all down. Um, there's record keeping, right? So documentation of activities and planning, financials, compliance, all of those documents uh, that you have in binders and elsewhere or send to other people, um, software can do that in general, right? So we're talking about all types of ag software out there. There's also software, a piece of it that can ha handle operations management, right? What's the equipment doing? Um, now let's get maps of our activities and let's get some prescriptions. There's also decision support. You know, so when data comes in, either it's an alert or it helps you make a decision or it decides for you. If it's in within this range, it comes up green. If it's within this range, it comes up yellow, right? That's decision support. Then there are data providers like satellite imagery companies, weather providers, other labs that provide you data, right? Think about your soil lab that tells you what's in your soil, right? That's a data provider. Then there are point solutions. Um, we hear a lot about Internet of Things um, or sensors uh, on the vehicles that tell you what's happening or, or UAVs, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, also called drones. And when you look at the market, Different types of software combine different aspects of these five things. And I made up four fictitious companies here. Um, the first one, number one, does a good job of record keeping and operations management. Number two can link point solutions with decision support. Number three can do record keeping with data providers, uh, data also coming in. And number four, it's just a really good sensor, let's say. Trimble is doing all five with Trimble Ag software. We're doing it today and we're going to continue to expand um, doing it in an easy way. So Trimble Ag Business Solutions, which is the group I work with, um, we're at the center of providing all this data for you, the grower who is at the top of the screen. So that way you have one place to go for your equipment data. You have one place to go to share data with your advisor if you do work with a food processor, that data can be shared with them or your distributor or your ag retailer. You decide who sees the data, you decide which data comes in, but Trimble Ag Business Solutions created the architecture so that way the software does the work for you and you can focus on your operations. For those who don't know who Trimble is, because we are getting more into non-mechanized growing operations, specialty crops and indoor uh, farming operations. Uh, we've been around uh, 30 years this year, over 9,000 employees, and our ag presence, um, a few points here is that we're headquartered in Colorado. Um, we service over 125 million acres uh, with quite a few displays and uh, GNSS subscribers for our correction services for our displays. So that's about us. Now let's get back to you and, and what you really wanted to hear about, which are some real world success stories. So I have actual, um, so what I've done is I've taken quotes that we've heard from growers who are buying our software, um, growers who are using our software um, from our different teams. So our inside sales teams talks to about 150 growers every day. Our support team gets about 80, 90 tickets a day and we get surveys. And you know we also talk to people at trade shows. And what I've done is collected a lot of those comments and created quotes out of them. I wasn't able to go back to those individuals and attribute, uh, attribute them to those individuals. So you'll see that um, these quotes are, are, are pretty similar in how they're written because I wrote them based on my recollection of what those people said. So let's get started. So the first 
success is that we provide uh, cost per unit of production. If I was at a conference and speaking, I'd ask you know, for a show of hands, how many people manage by cost per acre? And a lot of people would nod and, and raise their hand or make eye contact for sure. And then when I ask, what about how many people manage you know, at a cost per unit? And a cost per unit, we mean bushel, hundred weight, um, ton, tote, box, you know, melon, you know, whatever those units are. And um, what you're seeing here is a screenshot from our website. It's a piece of this report of the expenses breakdown where you can see the cost per unit of production on an expense area such as seed, fertilizer, and others. But you also can see it in a pie chart um, from a contribution point of view. And we're driving all of our software to be able to feed into the cost per unit of production. There are some things that don't contribute to cost per unit of production in terms of decisions. But just like your favorite truck factory measures its cost of unit production on a per truck basis, um, we see that it, with increased competition um, and, 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 and what's happening with the prices of both of inputs and at the commodity end and, and, and its grocery start to consolidate as well, there will be more and more pressure on this, just like we've seen in many other industries. So what this grower told me was that I like, I can see the cost per unit for each field and rank them, right? Rank each field, he means. The higher fields get more attention first. The higher items within each field also get looked at while planning for next season. I don't have to check every figure, which I don't have time for anyway. So moving on, similar to that, we can also see it in this way. Uh, this is a demo account we set up. That's why a lot of the information is similar across. We have potatoes. This is a report that we wrote up in our financials reports. And I circled five of the column headings, uh, revenue, revenue per unit, right? So that's revenue per hundred weight, the expenses, the expenses per unit, and then the net revenue per unit. Um, same type of logic. So. Seeing which crops are contributing what and costing what by field helps me tremendously. I use past seasons for reference and plan next season in the same report template. We completely, oh, typo there, we completely transitioned from Excel. And, and because it is linked to the fields and all the activities, all of those things feed into this table. And I can show you how. So we've looked at cost per unit of production and, and net revenue contribution by crop and field. Now we'll get into some reports. Uh, we hear from a lot of growers that, especially those who are uh, subject to FSMA, that they have a lot of people that need reports and uh, many people do. And so um, in this case, uh, we have a seeded acreage report where we have the field ID, which is the Trimble like software ID number, the field name, the legal description, which some people need, the seeded date, the seeded acres, the crop, and the variety. And what this grower said was this report is easy. The best part is I can fill it out on the mobile app while actually seeding, All right? So while he's in the tractor, he's filling out the app because he doesn't have a, a display to record it, but the app can do it for him. In this case, we have a product application report and it's organized, we have, about three or four different product application report templates. And this one is um, organized by um, manufacturer. So BASF, Bayer Crop Science, and Dow Agro Sciences, and then by product name. And then the acres to which it was applied, the average rate, and the total units. Um, in this case, the grower said, getting this report is easy as well. I can fill it out on the app while I'm in the cab or send it in from the display wirelessly. I like not having to fill out Excel later because keeping up with reporting takes up a lot of our time and I don't see it letting up. Okay, so now that we've seen some reports, let's see a couple things of the mobile app and what it can do. Um, this is bin capacity. So what we're looking at is a screenshot of a mobile app. It's, it's a demo account that we have. Um, up here at the top, I don't know if my cursor is showing up, but we have MF-2, and that's the name of the bin. Uh, then we have the crop, canola, 
the capacity of the bin, the current inventory of the bin at 8830, the space available at 170 bushels. We have a nice quick reference that we're 98% full. We can add a bin or take out a load, um, excuse me, we can add a load to the bin or remove a load from the bin uh, with the plus and minus sign. All of the loads associated with this bin are below, so we have four deliveries from field called Maple S28, that's the field name. Um, the most recent delivery was on September 26 at 6.26 p.m. Uh, for 880 bushels. The prior load is before that. I don't show it here, but if you go back one screen, then you can see every bin. So these blue squares that you see at the top, you would see all those blue squares stacked up on each other. So you could quickly look at your bins to see which ones are getting filled and which ones are, are not getting spilled as fast. And then you can go into that bin and then see this view. So this grower told me um, when we spoke, you know, we used to get our bin reports every few days. One season, a couple bins filled up more quickly than expected because of better yields. Had I known sooner, I could have redirected some loads to give us more flexibility later. Our logistics were a mess for a day because of that. Now I can see every load and bin on my phone as it happens. He confided in me that he's addicted to it uh, during harvest season. Um, so it's kind of interesting feedback. Another thing that we've done is provide the futures pricing, which a lot of people do, but also the impact to the top line on a daily basis, um, not just the price. So here we're looking at the commodities tab. Uh, this is a 2016 crop year. This person had uh, six, 1,695 acres. I believe this is a demo account, so a lot of these numbers may not add up. The projected gross revenue is 800,000 and the daily change was minus 554, so minus $554. The two commodity cards that we have here, one is for corn and we can see that the price change of 2.4 cents unfavorable netted a, a $3,600 drop in revenue based on futures. And beans were up 10.4 cents at the bottom, netting a, a positive change of 3,000. There are a couple other um, um, commodities below this. But because we take the target acres that were in your plan, as well as the target yield, as well as the futures price, then, okay, we kind of know what your expected production is. We go the extra step and say, yes, now you can see the daily change. So this grower said, used to be, I would check the price and see how much it changed day to day. Some days I would go a step further to see what it meant to my top line and he means at the farm level, right, as well as at the crop level. Now I open the app and it's there by crop and farm. So we're trying to make it simple. The next few slides are what can happen with data coming in from the display and what people have been doing. This is a screenshot from the website. Uh, if you look up to the top left, you see Stark number one, that's the field name. Um, the home farm under the Brian Stark organization. He's one of our employees. And um, it looks like some work was done. The operator was Jacob. The vehicle was the 4730. The materials was toward in 22K. And then the file. That's the actual zip file from the display. On the far right, you have a coverage map of that, of that um, field. And if you look up in the top right corner, you can see that we're looking at liquid rate. Um, if we were to click on that arrow, there would be other data sets that were available. The green is 6.91 gallons per acre on that legend in the top right. And the red is 13.48 gallons per acre. And you can see um, that coverage file over that field. What we've done is we've added a verify task and edit task button. Um, so that way, as these files are coming in, before they populate all of those tables and all those um, uh, financial reports that I showed earlier, we've given the operator and the owner, or excuse me, we've given the owner the option to verify tasks before they come in or edit them as they come in before they populate. And so here the grower said, um, and I remember this conversation, he was, um, he felt the pain, but he said, my team works hard. 
Sometimes they make a simple error or are new to the job and aren't familiar with the displays. The verify task and edit steps let me check the data coming in from the displays to be sure something wasn't done by mistake while they were doing their best to beat the weather. And the case he had was someone put down 200 gallons of Roundup. Well, they didn't put down 200 gallons of Roundup. They put down 200 gallons of, of liquid that had Roundup in it, and it wasn't 200 gallons of active ingredient. Well, he didn't catch it until the winter when he was doing his crop plans. And by then, you know, what had actually happened, it you know, been so long ago that he had to rack his brain to try to figure out what did actually happen so that way his product application reports were correct. And making a change so late in the season was, was some work that he didn't expect that he would have to do. And so by having this verify task and, and edit that he can do closer to when it's occurring um, was a big step for him. And uh, we, we've adopted that rule uh, across everything. Okay, I'm just checking chat. Um, there aren't any chat questions yet, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, this is another part of, of how we've integrated data coming from the display into the website and to our app. So here we're looking at a summary of uh, the hills field. And um, I've circled dry yield, and that's the dry yield map coming over everything from, according to the legend, zero bushels per acre all the way up to 47 bushels per acre. And then on the mobile app, there is a, a view of that layer uh, associated with that field. Um, I'm going to use my cursor and up in the top right, you see four, or excuse me, three squares that are stacked up like pancakes. That's the layers icon to allow you to choose different layers. And what we've done is we've chosen layers from the display for this field. And as you come down to the bottom, you see the legend dry yield, everything from zero out to 47.7. And if you click on these three dots, then you can pick other attributes of data, other layers that came in from the display, okay? And this story was that uh, this grower fertilizes after harvest. So here he says, we fertilize after harvest. We would make our fertilizer maps and calculate how much fertilizer we would need using the yield maps from the displays. We would rush from tractor to tractor to get the files with memory sticks. So imagine someone running around in their truck, running out to the fields, running up in the cab, slamming the stick into the display to get that harvest yield data um, and then running back and hopefully they have enough sticks and then they have to get back to the office to load it. And then so this final sentence is now the, fi the files are sent to the software with Wi-Fi or cell. What he also didn't mention also but I, but I can imagine is that person who used to run around doing that it's probably also driving a truck, getting the loads away from the fields, right? So you already have limited resources. And now instead of them chasing data, they're actually helping with the operation. I'm not saying that chasing data is not a good use of time, but rather um, could they be doing something that adds more um, to their operation than chasing sticks? Okay, and then this is different. This is pushing data to the display rather than data coming from the display. Um, and the title of this is updating seed rates and varieties remotely. So it took a risk and put two quotes on the same page because it's using the same part of the app. So let's walk through the app. So I think everyone's familiar that when you're, especially when you look at photographs on your app, you know, you, you scroll up, right? And you just keep scrolling and scrolling until you run out of photographs uh, to look at. So that's what this is. This, this first screen on the left is what the top of the app looks like when you first open it up. And as you scroll up, you see the center part of my screen, and then you see the far right part of the screen that starts with seed rate calculator. So we are currently in the seeding tile, the seeding portion of the app. Um, we are in a field called Arctic 3, where we're growing barley. This is the 2017 crop year. This is a, a demo account. They're actually not growing barley. Our, this is a demo account our inside sales team made. We're currently, so right beneath the feed field icon are three white lines with a blue line. That blue line designates where we are on this part of the app. So we're in the seeding part. If you go over to the right, you'll see a bag and a jug and the number one. That means this field has had one product application done. 
and then over to the uh, tractor with a zero. That means that no tractor or implement costs have been um, have been assigned to this field yet, but you can do it right from here. You don't need to go out several steps in the menu and come back in. And then this group of people is the operator um, with the zero. So while you're seeding, you can also apply products and chemicals. You can also assign your tractor and implement so you can capture those costs. And then you can also assign the operator so you can assign those costs. Um, the temperature comes in automatically, but you can edit it on the fly. And then in the middle, we have the crop, the description, the variety, um, the rate. And those are the, the major things. And then under advanced, not everyone uses this, but some people do. Um, you know, this is a global product. And so we get a lot of input from a lot of different folks. Um, we have seed lot, a seed certificate for those that need it, the seed source, the seed grade. And if you fill out seed issued out, seed returned and seed used, this will also update your inventory. Under the seed rate calculator, uh, we do have a rate um, and we have some other information here as well. So this first quote um, goes to the rate. So this, I squared off in a red square where it says rate at, excuse me, 90 pounds per acre. And so the quote is, the seed price went up several days before planting. I changed the rate on my app when I heard about it and told the office to push the new rate to the display. I didn't have to drive out to the tractor or call the operator to walk him through how to change it. So imagine that the grower heard about the chain, heard about the, the price. He went into his app, changed it to 90, synced it so that way his phone synced with the cloud, texted the office and said, hey, I got a new rate on RDEC 3. Can you push that file out to the display? When the operator got there, I mean, no one had to go to that display to change anything, right? We took those steps away. So that way, um, and he didn't have to call the operator and say, push this button, What's what do you see on your screen? Push this button, what do you see on your screen? And so it took the, uh, it just made it easy, right? The second quote on the bottom is about the variety and that's the red square up in the, in, in the top where it says variety tradition. Here the grower said, the reseller updates all of our displays each winter. One spring, we changed the seed variety a week before planting. The software updated the displays without the hassle and time of going to the tractors. So um, things change frequently and the software helps uh, manage those changes with less impact. Okay, so those are the three on the display. Um, I'm gonna shift topics to drone imagery. So here we have a picture of a, uh, a screenshot. Um, one of the layers is drone imagery. Um, so the, and it was applied to this field. And here the grower said, I, I like the software, but I'm purchasing imagery from another company, which by the way, Trimble's perfectly fine with. Um, and we support that. Having it all in one place on my phone makes it easy to find it when I need it, which is typically when I'm out in the field. And the native app means that the images are on my phone. So I'll pause there and just talk about native app. Um, native app is, is a term that means that the app is storing data on the phone. And you can access that data even when you don't have a Wi-Fi signal or a cell signal. So think about the times you didn't have a Wi-Fi or cell signal, but you could still access photos of your family on your phone, right? Because it's stored on your phone. And that's the same type of, of logic here with a native app. It means that it's stored on the phone. Um, you can make updates to the data. Um, you can delete data. And as soon as you have a Wi-Fi connection or cell connection and sync with the cloud, all that inf the, the, the cloud will be synced to represent what you had done on the phone. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna go into what we call the fleet part, right? So the tractors. Um, and we're gonna focus on some, some situations where you have, uh, two situations where you have dispersed operations. 
So on the left is a screenshot of our website. Um, up in the top left under the Trimble logo, it does say 2015. That's because someone was working in the 2015 crop year. But if you look right below where it says working state summary in red, you can see that the date is December 3, 2016. So uh, we are looking at December 3, 2016 data. Um, on the left are all the tractors that this grower has. Um, they are based in the southeast and operate nearly year round. So having tractors operate in December is quite normal for them. And I pointed out two things, a working state summary and a working state timeline. And I'm gonna walk through that. Uh, the pie chart shows, and basically three types of people were working with us, three types of customers, and they wanted data represented three different ways. So we said, okay, we'll represent it all three ways. So we have this vehicle that starts with A2, um, and it has the operator name. And there's a pie chart that quickly lets people know, oh, okay, it looks like they're working call it 80% of the time. So green is working, red is stopped, and blue is, is moving. And then it says total hours was 7.76, so that's from the start of their day to the end of the day. Of that 7.76 hours, they worked 6.87, they moved 0.14 hours, and they were stopped 0.76 hours. And if you want to see a timeline from the beginning of the day on the left to the end of the day on the right, you can see the green and the red and, and where those stripes are. And um, so that, and you can see this um, over a 24 hour period. So you can, so I'll come back up to the top. So you have the date, December 3. The start time that this person chose was 6 a.m. And they looked at a 10 hour shift, but you can toggle this all the way out to 24 hours and you can have the start time be any time of the day you you would or night that you would like on the right is a mobile screen app uh, image of our this is a different farm that's a 2018 farm map and i circled one of the two tractors because that's the csu jd8310 and you can see where it is and if you click on get directions then the, the mobile app will open up a new page and the phone um, map app that you use, so if you use Google or if you use the iPhone, that will show up and it'll have directions to where that tractor is using its lat long. And it can do that because it has a display in it. And what the grower told us when we were working on the, the website on the left was, we can't check on the operators all day because they are spread out. They work hard, but don't always ask for help when they should. The working summary helps us see who needs help. Also, they can't get lost getting to their equipment because we have directions. So, you know, someone that may have needed help, if you look at the second bar, you have that, that red bar right there in the middle. It's about an hour long, just guessing from the 1.23. You know, maybe that person was, you know, they, they were worried about the field or they're working with the display, trying to get it to upload some files, or they got lost. Um, they thought they were in the right field and they called someone and they didn't call the right person and they, you know, just to make sure that they were doing their job right. Um, so this gives the opportunity for the manager to work with them and say, hey, can you tell me what happened there? And, and then that way uh, you have more visibility and uh, more opportunities for improvement. I'm going to return to the mobile app for one moment. If you'll see the history button on the bottom right where it says history. And uh, if, when we do that, and I'm gonna go to the next page, when you click on that, this um, page shows up, um, the location history. And what we're looking at at the top line is something that occurred on November 16, 2016 from 1 p.m. on, and I had selected an eight hour view, which is what we're looking at. If you were to click on this pencil, that's, that's where you edit that date. So just, it's just like setting your alarm on your phone, right, with those dials. And I circle two sets of line. Uh, the green lines are working lines, and the blue lines are speeding lines. Um, there's also, there are also some white lines, and uh, if you look at the legend, it means pending. What that means is that the operator turned the display off before all of the data was uploaded to the cloud. So the display knows that something happened, the website knows that something happened, but because the display didn't shut off, the display didn't tell the cloud whether the person was working or speeding. 
Okay, so it just it's just pending, which is a safe way of saying, well, as soon as that data connection is restored, we will let you know exactly what happened, right? And so um, within those green lines and other lines, while it's really, really hard to see on the screen, there are white triangles that we call breadcrumbs. And what this grower said was, the breadcrumbs with speed lines have helped me a lot. I can see who went where and how fast they went. I just look at my phone while I'm in my tractor. And the software lets me set the speed limit for each operation. So each OEM has its own ways of deciding what is working speed and what is speeding speed um, and how long someone is stopped before they say, oh, this person actually stopped. And because all that data comes into our software, within our software, you can set that for yourself. Um, so that way, if you have an operation that is actually, you want done at five hours, but the OEM said, well, eight hour, or excuse me, if you want something done at five miles per hour, and the OEM, for whatever reason, said seven miles an hour and faster is speeding. Well, you'll never know if someone was going five, six, 6.9 miles per hour. Uh, but with our software, you can set it um, as precisely as you would like for, when it, for those that make sense, okay? So we spent a lot of time on, on financials, on, on what the app can do, on getting information from the display to the display and fleet. Um, now let's move on to something that everyone has to deal with, uh, which is the weather. And um, you can get field level weather with an add-on, which we call Ag Premium Weather. It's an add-on to the base package. And we're looking at two screens here. Um, this is the same map. This is the same farm that I showed earlier um, above. And it's the historical weather and I circled in red on the screen on the left, it says last 24 hours. And what you see in that green circle is every field associated with this farm. So I'll bring my cursor up. So you can see up in the top left, right around 9.30, 10 o'clock, there's a kind of a, a square sort of, and then a partial pivot. And then over on the right, between three and four o'clock, there are three rectangles. Those, those darker lines are the, the field boundaries. If I had fields 20 miles apart, then that radius, excuse me, the, the diameter of that circle would be 20 miles, right? So it auto sizes to wherever your fields are. And as you can see, uh, at least on February 8th, we had very little precipitation, if anything at all. Um, on the right, I went back to October 9th. I probably should have gone back further. It's been so dry here. But um, now you start getting contours of precipitation. And here it's not a huge difference because it was a slow, um, short period of time and we haven't gotten a lot of precip. But um, the lighter, excuse me, the darker is 2.78 and the, the lighter, more kind of lime green is three inches. And this grower, um, the, the grower that I had spoken to, which isn't the grower for this these fields because this is a demo field. I'm just linking quotes with... Um, with information I have access to. Um, I really like my weather station, but as I expand, I need more of them, which means checking in on more of them. Seeing all of my fields on a contour map by temperature, humidity, growing degree days, and precipitation is an easier way to go. Another piece that comes with Ag Premium Weather is hail alerts. For clarity, this doesn't tell you when hail will come or, you know, um, so it's not a warning. It's rather, um, it lets you know what had happened. In the US, um, we get a contour map, which you can see on the right. Um, it might be hard over the internet, but there's a light yellow band that kind of cuts from the middle of the left part of the screen to the bottom right of the right part of the screen. And then right around dead center, um, there are contours to get red and get into purple. In the United States, we have contour by the size of the hail, and the legend is on the far right. In Canada, um, it's either hail or no hail. And that's because of the, the weather service uh, that's in each country and the data that they are able to provide. Okay. And this was a storm that hit South Dakota um, last fall or you know, right around October. 
Oh yeah, October 12th, that's the date. And uh, we did have one of our employees double check it and we've tested this tremendously and it's been very effective. What's great about the hail alert is that it slims down the potential work you have to do. And it also helps you understand if something hit a field that you just didn't have visibility to. And it may also help you be alerted to something that happened in a field that could be agronomically resolved with help from your agronomist, depending on the time of season. So what this grower told us was that before last season, my agronomist and I checked the fields I thought were hit hardest by hail. We missed a few because we couldn't see the whole field, right? So imagine you're looking over a ridge and the back left corner got pounded. Last season, we went to the right fields, giving us more time to figure out what to do next. So hail alerts are about letting you know. Um, and the way it works is that any field bound, if there is a field boundary inside this contour, then you will get an alert. If all of your field boundaries are outside of these, outside of these contours, then you will not get the alert. And then the final two stories, and one of them is uh, time cards. Um, our time card replaces paper time cards. It replaces the checking in and checking out. It replaces the taking time off for a break and allows people to do it on their phone. It also shows where the person checked in and where the person checked out. Um, one of our developers was traveling to New Brunswick and checked in before his flight left and when he landed in Calgary, uh, checked out, or he checked out at his house. Um, so this, but it works in much closer uh, proximities as well. This grower said, my office manager spends a lot of time chasing time cards at the end of each pay period. So a larger team means more headaches. And it isn't clear where people checked in and checked out. Time Tracker helped us reduce a lot of busy work. And I did mention inventory management earlier, and that's the final uh, customer success slide that we have. On the left is a, um, a screenshot from inside our uh, inventory management piece of our software. Um, it doesn't show it, but there's a summary. So each one of these tabs can be clicked on. The summary provides a high level managerial summary of, of things that are important. Uh, you can look at the seeds you have in inventory, the fertilizer you have in inventory, the crop protection, and then we have another tab for uncategorized. And at the top of each column, we have the amount that's in inventory, the average unit cost that gets updated each time there is a purchase, the total cost, what was applied, the average rate that was applied, the total applied, and the balance. And this can be managed by crop year. And on the right, um, you can have, uh, you can manage your inventory and see inventory also by seed, by fertilizer and by crop protection. I have a screenshot of our seed inventory of our demo account and it's the tradition variety. Uh, the average over in the top right, right beneath 2017, the average unit cost was 36 cents per pound. On the left, the average rate was 90 pounds per acre. The amount we purchased was 9,000 pounds. The amount we applied was 7,900, and the balance was just under 1,100 pounds. So this grower says, I, I can't wait to see what my inventories are. I, I look at my crop protection inventories daily and when fields are completed. Operators enter the applications in the app while they're in the cab applying them. And he went on to say how that just helps him get um, you know, he's not in a rush to buy things and uh, and doesn't have to uh, create any type of issues when he's talking to his ag retailer. Okay, so that's quite a lot of stuff, uh, over a dozen, and um, uh, I really appreciate your patience walking through that. The next step is a handful of slides on how we think it makes sense to evaluate the return on investment, the ROI of software. And so I'm gonna tee this up with a couple situational slides and then provide you uh, a framework to consider when evaluating the ROI. 
So the situation we have here is um, we have time on the very top going from left to right. The blue boxes represent, you know, what could happen without software. So I'll walk through, and the yellow represents what could happen with software. So what could happen without software is someone in the field writes an observation down. For example, uh, the seed price went up. They might keep it in their truck. Uh, they might bring it to the office. They might, um, the person in the office might keep it on their desk. And at some time, you know, probably in, in batches, whenever they get back to that Excel sheet or something, they enter it into the system. And then the farm manager, the owner on the far right sees that outcome. It also might be bin tickets, right, for the loads coming in. With software, the person who made that observation enters it into the app and syncs it. And then that manager can see the outcome almost immediately. And so less time is spent per data transaction, right? Yes, there's more data every day on the farm, but it, it would be great if less time could be spent on every transaction. But what does this mean? Right, so let's take that situation without software, all those blue boxes, we'll copy it on this slide. Time is still moving from left to right. And what we've done is we've identified potential sources of waste in those light red boxes and what that means in terms of their impact on the bright red boxes on the far right. So at almost every step, there is a timeliness of the data that's creating a problem because it was kept in the truck, it had to be brought to the office, it was kept on the desk, and then the time it takes to enter into the system. And maybe that Excel sheet gets sent by email to the owner and it sits in their inbox for a while and then they finally open it up, but they're on their phone and boy, you know how Excel is on the phone. So basically what it means is that the issue is found later because of timeliness issues. Another source of waste is human error because a second person was entering the data in. And it could be maybe they put in 42 instead of 24, or maybe they couldn't read the ticket and had to make a guess, or maybe they had to call the person and get a response of what it was, which creates more timeliness issues. But because of that human error, more issues are created, right? By the time it gets to the owner or the, uh, the, the manager, that 24 that should have been a 42 creates an issue, and now that manager has, to, has another fire to fight. What happened? And then they find out, oh, it was a typo. And then resource allocation, right? So is you know, having that person bring it to the office or during harvest, having that person run from tractor to tractor to get those memory sticks loaded with the yield files and then entering it into the system is another resource allocation. So what happens is issues are found later, more issues are created, and there's less capacity among your personnel to fix those issues, right? And so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell of, of how we see that. So then how do you estimate a software ROIs? And I hate to use the economics answer, but it depends. Um, every farm is different, right? Trimble doesn't know if you lease your land or own your land. We don't know if you own your tractors or lease your tractors. We don't know your depreciation, um, you know, how you depreciate things. We don't know if you're LIFO. We don't know if you're FIFO. We don't know if you're weighted average. And so for us to say this is your ROI would be um, a stretch for us to do. So on the y-axis, you have profits from zero all the way going up. And on the x-axis, we have a bunch of steps. So calling a spade a spade, you know, software does cost money, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And it does take time to implement, right? Absolutely. But what you start seeing is you're starting to find issues sooner. And you didn't want those issues in the first place, but you find them sooner. You create fewer issues because you don't have double entry, right? People are entering it once and done. But what I did in the red ink there is those last two green boxes, this is where ROI accelerates. And it really depends on the value of those things in those boxes. So let's talk about those for a second. In the third box, now you can address what I would call cost reduction projects that maybe you didn't have time to do before. And you can do it with the same number of people. So if you had five cost reduction projects last season, and for whatever reason, you can only get to four, 
you know, were there things that could have helped you get to that fifth one? I, I don't know. It's just a question. Also, you can approach new marketing projects to increase the top line. So one grower told me that he was thinking about adding, you know, 50 acres of a specialty grain because he has a connection to a bourbon maker in Kentucky. And without software, it would have been too much time and effort to try and manage 50 acres of a specialty crop and to manage all the costs associated with that because, you know, it was just too much. But he had more time to, to do that because the software made it easier. So I really think, and the rest of Trimble thinks that the ROI is really in those, those far too right boxes because those may have been previously unattainable or previously unseen opportunities. And that's where software can really help. Okay, we do offer personal software training. Um, it's complimentary two hours. Uh, Trimble pays for it. You don't have to pay for this complimentary two hours. Um, if someone buys a new Farmer Pro or a Farmer Pro Plus license, we arrange for someone either from one of our resellers or one of our agri coaches to deliver the training. Anything after those two hours is between you and the trainer on, on how that wants to be done. That's, Trimble is not involved in that, but for those first two hours, we, we pay the trainer to train you, right? You don't, you don't have to manage that cost. You don't have to manage paying. We, we pay those trainers for you. We have uh, the, the content, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, we have an online printable starter manual that goes over like the first 10 things that are a good idea to do just to get you started up. And one of our salespeople told me about this. He, he said that there was a grower. He said, I wanted to purchase last season, but was concerned about not having enough time to learn it on my own. I purchased it after learning Trimble would pay for the first two hours of one-on-one -on -one training. It wasn't hard to use after all, just hard for me to try something new. And so this is just a graphic of what's in the, um, the starter manual um, so on the far left, how to create crops in Trimble X software, how to create materials in Trimble X software. Um, obviously, you don't put an N, P, and K. I, I was lazy, um, so that's, that's me. Um, how to create fields, right? So you might have two, they might walk you through how to create two fields, including the field boundary, the crop boundary. If you want to do field scouting, how to do field scouting. If you want to make recommendations, how to make recommendations. If you use benchmarks, um, which are points in the field, you know, how to, how to enter those, how to create a crop plan, how to create a field plan, um, how to record a seeding task, how to record an irrigation task, and how to record a rain event. Um, walk through that, you know, each of these, and I use folder just because I think people that deal with paper might also use folders. I, I do still in some cases. Um, but all this information is managed by field. And if you think about each folder being a field, well, we take those folders and put them in and manage them by crop year. So if you have a four high with, you know, a crop year in each drawer, that's how it's architected. So it's very similar. Um, how to arrange your farm level settings, such as your time zone, your currency, or your units of measure. Everything defaults to U.S., so if you have mixed units of measure or if you use um, metric instead of imperial, you want to know how to do that. And then down here, for those that have storage um, or bins, you know, how to create storage bins and how to manage transactions between the field and the bin and how to manage transactions between the bin and your customer. Okay, so that's all that's inside that two hour. Um, some growers take an hour, some take two but we're here to help you um, figure out, you know, how that works with you. Um, buying guide. Uh, so the buying guide that we put together is a list of, you know, what to consider when you're considering software. And there's a lot of software out there and um, here are some things that we've put together. Obviously you have your list, but um, some of the things that we've seen are, uh, is, is listed in on the far left. So there are nine items. 
your priority, you know, whether it's high or low or it's not an issue for you either way, where Trimble stands. And then if you're considering another one or two options, you know, whether they have it or not as well. So the first, you know, is there a support team for you to reach out to and get help? Um, is there software training one on one that can help you get through those first few steps? Is, pr is pricing flat rate or is it per acre? And I'll talk about our pricing in a moment. We don't believe in per acre pricing because um, you should benefit from your growth, um, not us. Is the mobile app native and available on Android and iOS? Um, or is it more like a website that you have to use through a tablet, right? You, you want the native app for sure. What's the general breadth of the software? So of those five major items that I mentioned early on, you know, how much does the, does the software cross across those five items? How many years in business has it been? API, um, so that's shorthand for basically a data um, um, standardization agreement. So that way when data comes in from somewhere else, it goes into the right places in our software. You know, so does it have APIs with other ag companies? We do. Uh, John Deere, CNH, Raven, Echo, uh, DTN for daily commodity prices, and then bar chart for futures. We use weather decision technologies for our weather, and we use Google for maps and, and other things. Is it an Ag Gateways ADAPT program? So ADAPT is an acronym that talks about, and it's a program, that is again about standardization. There's just so many devices, so many pieces of software, um, and Trimble is committed to making sure that our software interacts in a friendly way with everyone else um, using that pro you know using that um, program and um, uh, from Ag Gateway. And then, does it provide you a cost per unit of production across your whole farming operation? Or is it more limited to equipment? Or is it more limited to inputs? Or is it more limited to genetics, right? So does it cover your entire operations? For those who are interested, because we do get questions from time to time, uh, we do have our plans on our website. Um, up at the top left, it's agriculture.trimble.com software, and you can click on plans. Um, everything I talked about today is covered in Farmer Pro. And um, it's about 149 per month, so 1788 per year. And um, the, the, the difference between Pro and Pro Plus is Pro is up to five users and Pro Plus is up to 10 users. And Farmer Basic has no internet um, connectivity you know, to, to help you with, with that. So nothing from the desktop uh, was shared in today's presentation. Okay, and that's that. Um, so I'm looking at if there are any comments or any questions. And I'm gonna, I know it's one minute before five and I had hoped we get done about five or 10 minutes before five. I'm gonna stay around um, at least until, uh, for, at least for two more minutes because I know it takes time to type things and get it in. So it's five o'clock right now, and I'm going to hang around uh, for a while um, until uh, people have had time to type and, and send their comments in. So it's going to be quiet for at least two minutes while we wait for people to type. Oh, okay. I was looking under chat and I should have looked under questions. Wow, there are a lot of questions. All right. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to read this back to everyone. One of the most difficult things I see growers, including myself, is keeping tabs on grain inventories and reconciling these with deliveries. Is there part of the app that would aid in this? Absolutely. And, um, 
Brent Cowsley. Um, if you go to YouTube and type in Experience Trimble Ag Software, there is a um, video that covers that. How do you select, and here's the next question. How do you select the vehicle that you want to send the data out to from app? Or is that only able to be done on the web? Excellent question. So the data that goes to the vehicle is sent from the website. However, the data that's in the app, so for example, the example of the seed variety, if you change the seed variety on the app, that will sync with the website. The actual button to press to send it to the display is on the web. And you can choose the dis you can choose which display it goes to from the web. Okay. Is the weather data captured from a weather station on a vehicle or satellite data? Correct. Good question. So the weather data is provided by um, Weather Decision Technologies. And what they do is they collect data from all available public and participating weather stations, and then they interpolate that down to the field level. And so um, even though you may have a field, you know, your closest um, weather station may be a few miles away, but because they use a network of all of them, and also bring in other weather information, they interpolate on, based on that. Does this support, okay, sorry, next question. Does this support Australia? The answer is yes. However, the, pre, ag, the premium weather uh, is not supported in Australia at this time. Where do I get starter manual? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to show you. So if you go to our website and go to agriculture.trimble.com.software, come over to support and then scroll down to find answers now. This is our how-to central. This is our starter manual and you print that out. And um, we used big font and we used a lot of pictures. So when you see the number of pages, it's okay. Um, print it anyways, <laughs> you'll be fine. We wanted to make sure it was easy to use. Uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. If you need a question, can you add extras to the plan? Customize extra. Oh, yes. Okay. So, all right. Here's a question. Can you add extras to the plan to customize extra vehicles? Yes, absolutely. All right. Question. Could you direct me towards further dealer training? Thanks in advance. Absolutely. Um, if you could please call the number here or email, oops, where'd it go? Email this. If you could write this email at the bottom or call this number and press the number for sales, they will get you in touch with the right people. Okay. All right. Next question. Do you have an example of a farmer dashboard? Sure. Um, I would have to log in, which I'm happy to do. Uh, let's see here. So the question was, do I have an example of a farmer dashboard? And the answer is yes. Um, so here's a dashboard of this demo account where we have a map, uh, we have field task history, we have the fleet, we have commodities and futures, uh, percent harvested, percent planted. This is the 2018 crop year. I'm gonna go back to the 2016 crop year because I think there's more information. 
Um, and then once you're in this map, you can change the settings. So that way, uh, if you want an overlay, I want my, I want my Doppler. Um, and you can also, you know, make these smaller and, you know, add, add another widget. Uh, maybe you want uh, something with weather that's, um, you know, it has, maybe you want a national weather and you want a local weather. Um, so that's how you would do that. Okay, cool. I am a college student. Okay, next question. I am a college student studying about farmers and technology. Great. Can I talk to anyone in Trimble to understand more about the technology and the problems people face? Absolutely. Um, if you call the number or email uh, at the bottom of this, I would be happy to talk to you and help you out. And also hear from you what you see. Um, it would be great if it was two way. Next question. If seeding across two fields at one time, how do you separate the two fields after? Ah, yeah, right. So you're asking if, and I'm guessing you have a display in your tractor and you decided to um, seed both at the same time. Well, the display will know if it's out of one field and another. And today, we don't have a way to split the field or we don't have a way to split the task into two fields, um, but it is being worked on. If you're talking about what about in the software, what would you do? Well, if we were in a field, um, let's pick on this one. If you were adding a, a seed seeding event and you were in the software, you could add all your information up here and then check over here on the left that you want that same seeding to be done in all of these fields. And that's how you would do it all at one time. Um, so there's two ways of doing it. You could do it manually this way or from the um, display. But the, the desired process though is um, if you have a display and you're seeding across two fields, you'd wanna do each field. If your field is actually a bed and you're seeding two beds, um, I would ask support for help on that one. Uh, personally, I, I don't know how that would work, but they would be able to help you if there is a current solution for that. Okay, next question. Are third parties able to access farmer data collected in Trimble software? Only if you let them. Um, we like to play nice with all of our folks that are in um, software and in ag, only if you let them. Now, having said that, um, you know, we do share data and you can see this on our privacy, like we need to let resellers know that someone bought software in their area, right? So we'll let them know, but we don't give them your data, right? We'll say Jim Smith from Lynchburg, Kentucky bought this. Uh, he's in your service area, please be aware. But our business model is not selling data. Our business model is um, selling software. Okay, next question. How much is the advanced desktop accounting add-on? Uh, it's between seven and $800 uh, one time. Okay, next question. Question, can you attach a photo of the grain elevator receipt to the bin name? Ah, I see. So you have the receipt and you want to attach it to the bin name. You know, today um, that specific workflow is not supported. However, what you can do is under farm, go to documents and guess what? We have cloud storage. So if you have folders, which I have here, here are all the folders that we created. If you wanted to create um, a folder for bin number one, a folder for bin number two, a folder for bin number three, then you could store all of those uh, photographs here for now. We don't have a way of doing it within what you were talking about, which is in here. This is our storage um, area, but that's a great idea. That's pretty cool. In fact, sorry, the transactions. These are the bin transactions here. That's pretty cool. I like that. 
All right, next question. Just like Australia, is this software also available in Pakistan? Yes, it is available. And I wanna clarify something. This software is available globally. The only piece that is not available globally is that weather, right? Let me go back because we had a lot of things. So this premium weather, this is taking longer than I thought. Let me go over here. So this ag premium weather, this piece, and the hail alerts are available in US and Canada. And this is an add-on. Everything else is available globally. Okay, next question. Can you have a hybrid units of measure refer to using imperial and standard units in your settings? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, Canada is one of those countries that is like that. Um, when you go into your settings and you have your unit system, you can also customize your unit system, a US metric, but if you customize it, then everything comes out. Area, depth, distance, speed, weight, volume, temperature, pressure. This can also be updated on your phone as well. You don't have to come to the website to do it. You can do it on your phone as well. Okay, I'm in Australia. Okay, next question. I'm in Australia and use Trimble FMX. Uh oh, all right, we got a ringer in the crowd. We got a tough one. All right, let's see. I'm in Australia using Trimble FMX in my tractors, Green Star in my sprayer. I grow avocados, peanuts, corn, tropical, pasture, seed, and sugar cane. Does this software support these crops? Uh, yes, so avocado, peanut, corn, tropical, pasture. Yes, yes they do. Um, and if they don't do it specifically, then they'll do it with the variety because the variety can be hand entered in. So add a crop. So what? No avocado. It used to, uh, I thought we did that for Mexico. All right, but we can we can add that. That that's not a big push. Um, we can add avocado. Let me see here. We got avocado, peanuts. Yep, there's peanuts. Uh, corn, yes, tropical pasture seed. Ooh, um, oh, pasture. So you could put, under pasture, you could put for variety or description, you could put tropical uh, seed if you'd like. And then what was the last one here? Sugar cane, yes, sugar cane's right there. So avocado's the miss right now. Um, that's a bummer. And if you needed it today, I would recommend maybe something that has same units uh, as, as that. And um, we can add avocado later on if you like. I'm shocked. I thought we did that for Mexico because I remember we had a request before. All right, next question. Um, can you post calibrate yield data from green star display. So yield cleanup on, um, so the answer to that, I believe is, I need to get back to you. So I have your name. Um, I know we're working on yield cleanup um, in the next couple of development cycles. I don't know what's available today, but if you contact our inside sales team and I'll have them reach out to you, Mr. D, and we'll go from there. Thanks, you're welcome. Okay, so those are all the questions that came in. Um, kudos to the person who made me look up seven crops, that's good, I'm glad you asked, because uh, I learned too. And um, so that's it, so thank you very much for your patience, I know we went way over, and looking forward to the next time we can reach out to you. And uh, Marlon, I'll have uh, Inside Sales get out get back to you on the one question I wasn't able to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day, wherever you are. Bye-bye.